Um, referencing 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. And the question is, I know we will continue to sin, but God helps us overcome sin when we let him transform our nature to become like him. But what about those who deliberately sin and do not want to change, even though they say they are believers? What a great question. Uh, this is it's so important for us to recognize that God has an incredible amount of grace for those of us that want to go on to be like him. There's, the grace is unlimited when, in fact, we're growing in our relationship with God. When our heart's desire is to follow Him. Will we sin? Yes. As a matter of fact, there's a verse of Scripture in, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2 that talks about, uh, do not sin. But when you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus already recognized, look, we're the sons and daughters of man. Guess what? The sin nature runs pretty deep. So there is going to be those times when we're going to miss the mark. That word is transgression or sin. And it's, a, it's an archery <coughs> term, and it means miss the mark. And there are going to be those times, even though we have a relationship with Christ, where we're going to miss the mark. And those are the times we have to recognize the deeper level of the, of the fact that we are, are seeking after Christ with our heart. We're longing after Him. We don't like the sin. Every now and then we fall into it. We don't like it. That we hate it. There's a lot of grace. Now, I want to go on a little bit farther. There is no grace for those who are using Jesus as a scapegoat. If you're using Jesus just to, to justify your sinfulness, well, I'm saved. It's all good. I can do whatever I want. There is no grace for that. So I just want you to be aware that, uh, that uh, 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2 tells us that when we are seeking after God, we have an advocate, one who speaks on our behalf uh, before God. Okay. <clears throat> next question is for Emily. How can we engage young people so they will become the next generation of the church and we don't lose them? <laughs> so I just want to start by telling you, answering the question you're all wondering. No, I did not write that question and put it in the envelope. <laughs> Even though I can't think of a question that I would like to answer more, that is that uh, I didn't I didn't write this one. Someone else did. I'm not sure. Unless I can source some questions for it. I think uh, I was sitting. I knew this was coming up, and I looked at the stage. I don't know if you guys noticed who is up here leading us this morning, and we had a lot of young people. And I think, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but to me that is the essence of what we need to do. We need to give up the keys of our leadership and of our uh, responsibility, and we need to open up those doors and allow ourselves to be led by our young people. And that's been my experience in this church my entire life, and I see it continuing on. And so I will come, come back around to that, but I just wanted to uh, mention that first thing. Jim Burns says, we know that preaching, lecturing, and ignoring faith issues in our families is not working. And uh, I've been highly influenced by the work of Kara Powell and the Fuller Youth Institute. They've done a great study, one of the books called Growing Young, which if you've spoken to me at all recently, you will have heard me talk about this. It's powerful and it's, um, it's, really, it's really key. But the first thing I want to say is that the thing that you hear every time we do a child dedication, you, the parents, are the primary influence in your child's faith development. Developing faith in our kids is not a value-added option, and yet we are not always intentional about the way that we create the environment for the Holy Spirit to lead our kids. And I want to release you as parents, it's not all on you, you are not, you're not responsible for your children choosing to live in faith or reject faith. But it, uh, John Westerhoff has talked a lot about it, it's this pilgrimage mentality of you as parents journeying with your children inviting them into your faith story, sharing experiences with them. And so as parents, that's one thing that you guys can do. It's about the vibrancy of your faith. And so it's kind of like that um, oxygen mask in the airplane. Make sure you've got your oxygen on first. Make sure your faith is in place. And uh, I have a great book I can recommend if you're looking for practical ideas. Ideas Taking Faith Guide for Your Family. I loved it. There's over 100 ideas, and you don't have to use them all, but it's just a, a kickoff. But I think the question probably pertains more to... Um, the church. And that's where I want to come back to this idea of multi-generational. And they were looking, Kara Powell talks about, they looked for a silver bullet, the thing that's going to make sure kids did not walk away from their faith. And what they said is they didn't find one thing in particular, but what they found was silver shavings. 
and that silver shaving was involvement in intergenerational worship and relationships, and particularly having five faith-building adults in the lives of your children and youth, and they do not have to just be your Sunday school teacher. It could be any one of you who are sitting here who says, you know what, I see something in Adam, and I'm gonna write him a card, and I'm gonna say, I like your hair, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, come, and, I'm gonna come and watch your concert, and I'm gonna be there for you, and each one of us can do that. And not only does that benefit our youth and keep them connected, it builds social capital for the rest of us as well. And so I think for me, the, the number one thing that I talk about over and over and over and over again is how important it is for us to take down silos and not keep our kids in one room and our youth in another room and our singles in another room and our young families over here and our, and our older adults out here, that we need to be the church and the family of God. And, and studies are overwhelmingly supporting the fact that that is the way to keep our youth and to keep our church healthy. Amen. Can I actually ask you to clarify just one thing? I heard you use the phrase taking down the silos, and the yeah. first time I heard that, I didn't know what it meant. Okay, so silos are what we call the traditional church model of how we organize ministry. So churches typically have programs. So we'll do uh, nursery to grade five, and that'll be one silo. We'll invest, we'll have hire a pastor to deal with nursery to grade five, and, and uh, then we'll hire a youth pastor. And then we'll hire a college and career pastor, and we'll hire. But all of these ministries or programs run separately from each other. And the concept of intergenerational and multi-generational is that we start to mix that all up together, and we start to allow our children to interact with our older adults and our young teens to to maybe talk to uh, talk to our senior teens. We might even invite singles out to a dinner with married couples. It's revolutionary, but we might try that. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> says the single person who doesn't get invited to marry some of the No, <laughs> no uh, but it's just this idea that we all are, are one family, and so instead of having the programming is typically in church model referred to as a cycle. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Angel. A bit of a topic change here, but did Jesus and the Holy Spirit exist before the New Testament? Where were they, and do we see them acting? Okay, yes. The, in the very beginning in Genesis, it talks about, let us to, uh, to create the world. Uh, it was the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the, the, the Trinity and the theology of the Trinity. I mean, one of the uh, major councils in the past of the early church, they discussed these things, okay? And in some councils, they, it was rejected. But in others, it was accepted. It was the facts were found to prove about God the Father, God the Son, God of the Holy Spirit. Some people have a hard time with that. So I tried to explain that to them in, in a way like, uh, you have water, you have ice, and you have you know, three manifestations, but one, right? Uh, from the very beginning, we see that in the, in, in the Old Testament, before we have kings in the Old Testament, God spoke in various ways, okay? And he used visions, <coughs> he used dreams, he used people, he even used a jackass, right? In various ways, he, he, he uh, spoke and showed the manifestation of God. Okay, especially, you know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there are groups many times that when we talk about the, the excitement, the, the uh, lightning, the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, manifestation, okay? And, and yet, that works. That, that works. Uh, we have the Mount Carmel experience, you know, when, when the Ezekiel, uh, not Ezekiel, Elijah. Elijah called down, you know, fire from heaven, you know, and then the next day, that was God working there, God the Holy Spirit, God is now working there, but and then the next day, you know, it, it, uh, Aja was facing depression, and he was expecting God to move in, a, in another mighty way through an earthquake, you know, through a fire, and God didn't move that way. God moved through a small, still voice that spoke to Elijah. You see? And throughout the whole testament, we see God using people, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that in the book of Judges, you know, with Gideon, okay, with Samson, Delilah, 
Okay? God comes upon them and they are used for a specific uh, 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 battle to defeat the enemy. Then we continue through the whole Old Testament to see God moving. Okay? So God then decides he was never a man, correct? Was God a man? No. No. But now he became a man to identify with his culture. And God started working in these people's lives. The Holy Spirit moving. Not only now through through to through the people, but through major events. I mean there's a lot of teaching here that, that takes place. Then you have what you call, okay, the Pentecost movement. God working through the Holy Spirit. God foretold that the Holy Spirit will come and manifest himself. Now the Holy Spirit manifested himself in the day of Pentecost and people's lives were touched and many were saved. And then we continue to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts and the life of Peter and the life of Paul. God moving by his Holy Spirit. So everything involves God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now because of this theology, okay, but we believe we believe because the God, that the Word of God is uh, perfect. We, we believe that the Holy Spirit, okay, continues to work even now. And He works when He wants to, not when, I, not when we want to. When He wants to do something. And sometimes we talked about that. When the, we look at the, the will of God in our lives and sometimes He says, No, but then I will give you what? What's the second best of God? There's the submissive will, right? Permissive. Hmm? Permissive will. Permissive. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> permissive will of God. Okay? When he said, okay, this is not for you, but this is what you really want, go ahead and do it. Okay? I mean, this. I mean, to give me five minutes to talk about this, the Holy Spirit, there's so much, there's so much in this, but uh, if you're really interested, I have tremendous books of teaching on the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, twice I've done an extensive study on the Holy Spirit. So God the Father is working, God the Son is working, we see that in Christ, the life of Christ. Okay, and God the Holy Spirit, and now God the Holy Spirit is working today. Okay? In a miraculous way, changing the life of people. Sorry it took so long. That's all right, I think we've had your next sermon series. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this question's for Randy. Does forgiveness have to mean forgetfulness? If I don't want someone back in my life after they have hurt me, does that mean I haven't forgiven them? Such a powerful thing. Uh, so often you, you, you hear me talk about forgiveness as the, the gateway to healing. Uh, when we forgive someone, it's important that we, uh, we process through that. It is not the same as, for, as forgetfulness. There are going to be things that people have done to us in our past that, uh, that we just cannot allow them to come back in, into our lives and be able to abuse us or hurt us in those ways again. So it's so important for us, when we forgive people, there's going to be times when we need to build up boundaries and set godly boundaries so that in fact we don't set ourselves up to be hurt in that way again. So that's important for us to do. Uh, and so, the passage of scripture that comes to my mind is Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. And I'll see if I can't locate it correctly. Is it? <laughs> yes. So it says this, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Well, up to seven times? With me being gracious? Lord, up to seven times? Is that what you want? It says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. What that talks about in this whole thing of forgiveness, in our forgiveness we need to walk in forgiveness. So it's not about, you know, forgiving somebody, well, that was once, and the next time, well, that was twice, and do it that way. But rather, it's a walking in forgiveness. But the essence of the question that's asked is, what about setting ourselves back up there to be hurt again. And I'm saying 
we really need to set boundaries. When people have hurt us, or they've hurt us more than once, we need to set up godly boundaries, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a right thing to do. It's not wrong for us to, to, uh, to say, you know what, uh, it's an unhealthy thing for me to be involved in, in any type of relationship with you, therefore, I have to cut that off in order to maintain my uh, well-being. Understand? So it's, it's a, forgiveness is one thing, forgetfulness, uh, only God can help us forget things, and He will, in time, help us to forget some things. That forgiveness is the key issue. Do not set yourself back up for being hurt again. So there's godly boundaries. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Emily. How do we know that the Bible is true? Isn't it circular reasoning to use the Bible to prove the Bible? Also, what does the Free Methodist Church itself teach about the infallibility of the Bible? So, I, uh, I started doing a little preparation for this question, and I fell down this rabbit hole of philosophical, question, philosophical questions about what is truth. And I, I thought, I am never going to come up with an answer for this because I've just spent way too much time on this. And uh, anyway, I will not thankfully share all of that with you this morning. But I wanted to start by asking back this question about what is my relationship to the Bible? And too many stop short of asking that question and they ask only how can I learn to understand the Bible? And I think what I would, where I want to start with that is just to remind us that the Bible is God's story. And the main mission of the Bible is that we become people who love God and love others, as Augustine eloquently said. So much more eloquently than I could. So the question is the Bible true? And for me, the, there's a lot of ways, a lot of ways we could go with this. But the biggest thing for me that I want to bring back is that I believe the Bible is true, and I find it most compelling that it is true, because I believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus believed in the authority of the scriptures and the truth of the scriptures. It defined the way he lived, it defined his ministry, it defined how he understood who he was. And as a follower of Jesus, I'm called to do the same. And so I think that that leads kind of into the next question about the authority of the scriptures and the circular reasoning. And I think that what I would like to say is I could go into specifics. I won't this morning because I thought it could get us a little bit off topic. But the Gospels are remark remarkably reliable accounts of who Jesus is. And historical literature is not nearly as scrutinized as the Bible. And uh, it's something I've, I've done a little bit of reading about. And it's how close these first-hand accounts are to when these events actually took place. And before the day of, of the uh, Wikipedia days, no, I'm just kidding, that's not reliable information, just in case you're wondering. Uh, before that, what eyewitness accounts were how people verified the stories. And so the fact that these Gospels are eyewitness accounts that were written down before, and I get that this is a Bible, so I'm written in the circular reasoning, but what I want to do is pull those out as, as an aside. And they were written close, sometimes within a generation of people who actually saw and interacted with Christ. And the number of accounts we have of those are highly reliable. And so I would just point you to the fact that we, we often doubt the Bible, and I think some of that has to do with our modern mindset. We are uncomfortable with miracles in general, and we have live in a time where we want everything to be verified by facts and figures, and, and the Bible certainly does not do that. But it, the Gospels are remarkably accurate accounts, and I think they tell us that Jesus existed, and I, so my relationship and my acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus is what compels me to think the Bible is true. There's other things. Um, we see archaeology has time and again proven it, and then it'll disprove it, and then it'll prove it again, but there are other things that kind of tie into the fact that we can see that the Bible is, is, um, is accurate and true. I will say that I would like us to be patient with the perplexing parts, the parts that don't seem to fit what we understand. It is God's inspired book, and as we interact with it, it the Holy Spirit en en enables God's Word to continue to transform our lives today. I want to just touch on infallibility, because I might be getting one. I actually printed off something. So infallibility, in case you're wondering, it is 
Rather than the lack of error, when somebody asks about the infallibility of the Bible, they're focusing more on the trustworthiness of the Bible and fulfilling the scriptures and fulfilling purposes for which God intended. And so if we're believing our perspective, our relationship with the Bible is that this is God's word to us, it's his story, it's his calling us into relationship with him, then it's going to change the way we kind of frame that question. But I want to read to you. So we have in our denomination something called the Articles of Religion. And there's 21 Articles of Religion. You can access them on our website. I can print you out a copy. You can get them at the welcome desk. These tell us what we as a denomination believe about particular issues. And so the scripture's authority, it is, I'll read it to you. The Bible is God's written word, uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit. It bears unerring witness to Jesus Christ, the living word. As attested by the early church and subsequent councils, it is a trust, trustworthy record of God's revelation, completely truthful in all it affirms. It has been faithfully, faithfully preserved and proves itself true in human experience. So what we're saying is that we believe that, well, I, I'll finish it, I'll tell you. The scriptures have come to us through human authors who wrote as God moved them in the languages and literary forms of their times. So we're touching on context there. God continues by the illumination of the Holy Spirit to speak through this word to each generation and culture. The Bible has authority over all human life. It teaches the truth about God, his creation, his people, his one and only son, and the destiny of all humankind. It also teaches the way of salvation and the life of faith. Whatever is not found in the Bible or can be proved by it is not to be required as an article of belief or as necessary to salvation. So we believe that the Bible is infallible, that everything we need to know about who Jesus is, who God is, and God's plan of salvation for us is contained within the scriptures and does not need to be added to. The Bible is God's word, read in historical context. It's not a 20th century legal document. I just want to point that out because there are times where we bump into things that don't seem to add up. But these minor issues that surround the Bible never affect the central content and all important message that Jesus, of Jesus. And so, uh, this is one of the Holy Spirit part, where right? those about the Bible comes alive, the Holy Spirit transforms through Jesus as revealed to us in the scriptures. Um, the next question is for Angel. What has been a highlight of your years at Smith Falls Free Methodist Church? God at work putting this church together. With the pastor that kept thinking, when is this going to all fall apart? And God was teaching me about trust. And with that, God worked in, in a mighty way. And for those 20, almost 24 years, we have seen tremendous transformation of people's lives and also of the church and the community. Uh, second highlight I would say, my family. To me this church is more than just a church, it's my family. Where I feel comfortable around many of you and I love you so much. I could never, I could never forget this church, this congregation, never. Each life, each miracle, each transformation. The third highlight, <clears throat> four times, God overtook me by his Holy Spirit. And I pray with confidence to lay hands on individual and miracles took place. Mrs. Reamer, thank you for helping. The miracle in the hospital, Mrs. Reamer. 
I maybe had less than half an hour to live. And God raised her from that bed. Not in two months or three months, but within one week. And documented by two doctors who say that the only way she's going to survive is the, the man upstairs, he called him. And her husband was there with me, and we witnessed this. Second great miracle, I just mentioned these two, is when we had a young teens event at the Will's home, Kevin, Rachel. They opened their home and we had a whole bunch of uh, young teens running around. And I kept looking up and I kept seeing Stuart not able to do anything because he was so sick. I forgot the illness he had, but it was uh, impacted him so much. Crohn's, Crohn's disease. And God just stopped me where I was at. He says, gather these young teens together and pray for them. I said, Lord, these are young teens. He says, put them together. And then we call Stuart now. And these young teens, not knowing any better, gather around him, we put their hands on him, and we pray, and I thought I was the only one that prayed, but two or three others prayed. Young teens. The story was healed. How could I forget that? I can never forget that. The final highlight is God gave me a woman he was very patient with me through these 24 years. Very patient. There were times when I should have gotten, you know, hit by a two by four. <laughs> <laughs> Many times. But the patience always there to help. Especially at the Sunday morning sermon, she said, let's talk about the sermon. I said, can you wait until Wednesday? <laughs> God did the work. He gave me a wife that was there all the time. And there were times, I've always been vulnerable, but there were times well, I was a pain in the butt, lightly put. And she looked beyond the fault. She always saw my knee. The only person that really understands me and knows me inside and out. Those are the highlights of my life here. Okay, thank you. I think that is it. Well, to wrap it up, what we wanted to do with this, with this kind of a panel of answering questions is we want to do this more often. It won't be all the time, but once in a while we'll be doing this. The concept is this. We want to give you permission to ask questions. See, the wisdom that you seek is not, is not found in well-stated <coughs> arguments. The wisdom that you're seeking is going before the Lord and asking questions. And the wisdom comes in the journey. Seeking God out and Him stretching us because we don't understand something. Sort of like that first question I asked it was asked to me yesterday. We may not understand it, and it's okay for us to start to grapple with issues and uh, and ask God about them. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter what the question is. God can stand the scrutiny. He can take the scrutiny. So all that to say, look, folks, keep asking questions. Keep seeking the wisdom of God. The truth will set you free.